Hello, my name is Dr. Lace Padilla. To begin, I'd like to give you a little context behind what motivated this research. Now, in 2015, Peru had an extreme cold weather event where the high mountains were completely covered in snow and very, very cold temperatures. What this resulted in is over 90,000 alpacas passed away. Now, I collaborate with people at the Red Cross, and they gave me this story about having to develop a forecast-based financing system, wherein they use short and long-term weather forecasting models to decide when to issue emergency aid to these alpaca farmers. Now, reasoning with uncertainty is very difficult for the general public, but also for experts. And that brings us to our research question. We wanted to know if any of these visualizations require more or less effort. And that can help us give recommendations about how to convey this information, both for meteorologists and for the average person to understand effectively. Now we're focusing on uncertainty communication, and we have these five different communication techniques. To begin, let's first talk about our control condition. Here we have a forecasted nighttime low visualization that just shows the mean. Now the actual task that we had people do is we had them assume the role of a Red Cross worker and they had to determine when the temperature will drop below 32 degrees. If it does drop below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, then they should issue aid to the alpaca farmers. The second type of communication that we wanted to compare this to was a text table. And we were interested in looking at text because some recent work has been criticizing uncertainty visualizations. So that was the motivation here, is that maybe this textual expression requires less effort than the visual expressions. And we wanted to compare this to a 95% confidence interval that was visual. Now we didn't really think that these types of confidence interval plots would be the best type of communication. There's a large body of work demonstrating that they tend to find some of the most poor performance, but it was a direct comparison to the text table. Now these three together create a class of summary annotations where you have continuous probabilistic data and you summarize over that space in some way. The other big category is distributional annotations that convey more of the, the full distribution of information. Focusing here on the first one, which is a density plot, um, what we wanted to do is to determine if we're really showing more of the spread, if that is useful, or maybe it's more effort to understand because there's really just more information going on here. Now, this density plot is just one of many different types of uh, probabilistic annotations that we could have used. We specifically selected the density plot because it's received so much empirical evaluation and it tends to do fairly well when compared against um, other visualization techniques. The last one is a quantile dot plot and it utilizes frequency framing. What I mean by frequency framing is expressing something in a format of one of 10, kind of a ratio versus 10% probability. As an example, if I asked you to determine what the probability that the temperature would be 32 degrees or below in this plot, if you try to do that with the density, you would look up 32 degrees and then you would have to mentally do the integral under the curve, which is really complicated to do visually. With a quantile dot plot, what you could do is count up the dots. Each of these dots in this particular version represents a 5% probability. So you could count 5, 10, 15, and then you would conclude that there's between a 15 and 20% probability that the temperature will be 32 degrees or below. And the way we know that is how these are generated. They're based on a cumulative probability function, and we can actually kind of work backwards and determine the explicit probability of any temperature, you know, on these, any value really within the quantile dot plot. And that gives us the five communication techniques that we're gonna examine. The next part of our title is we're going to measure effort using individual differences in working memory. Working memory consists of multiple subcomponents in the mind that stores a finite amount of information for a short period of time. It's really the cognitive process that is responsible for effort. So this metric of working memory demand is very useful because we can measure it with things like neuroimaging that some visualization studies have done in the past. We can also measure it with pupillometry. So these techniques are great, but they require 
machinery that you might not have access to. And what we wanted to do is find another way of evaluating working memory that you can do online. So that brings us to the individual differences part of it. What this individual differences approach allows us to do is to look at how people vary in terms of their working memory capacity. So if we find that people with very low working memory capacity have difficulty with one or more of those visualizations, then we would have some evidence that those visualizations required a lot of working memory. And the cool thing about these is that there are standardized measures of working memory that have been developed in psychology. The unfortunate part is that there wasn't any good free online versions, so we made one. The versions that we created are on our online repository. So let's take a look at one of these working memory measures. This is called an O-SPAN task. And what it does is it measures how much information you can store in your mind and, and hold there. In this version, what happens is participants see a math problem for five seconds that they have to solve, and then they see an image that they have to remember. And they see a sequence of math problems and images, and they have to remember the order that the images appear to them. So let's take a look at one. They're presented with this math problem for five seconds. And then they answer a true-false question. Then they remember an object. At the end, they see an array, and they have to click on the items in the correct order that they viewed them. And what happens is people will see a four span because there are four items and then a five span and then a six span. So we can get, um, you know, a coarse measurement of how much information they can store in their mind. Okay. And the last way that we measured effort in this experiment is with the NASA TLX. It's very straightforward. It's just a survey that someone does at the end of an experiment where they just rate how mentally, physically, temporally <laughs> demanding the task that they just did was, um, how their performance was, effort, and frustration. For the design of the experiment, we had five different groups, and each group only saw one of these communication techniques. Now within each of these groups, while participants only saw one visualization technique, the visualizations varied based on each trial. So we had different mean temperatures ranging from 31 degrees Fahrenheit to 36 degrees. And then we had three different standard deviations within the data itself. Now let's look at incentives and how we evaluated accuracy. These are the actual instructions we provided. But here I'll summarize. We told people that they had a budget as a Red Cross risk manager. For 18 days, they had $18,000. And issuing blankets cost $1,000 per night. Now there was a penalty for not issuing blankets if the temperature did drop below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and that was a $6,000 penalty. Now they would receive 10 cents at the end of the experiment for every $1,000 they had left in their budget. Okay, so the optimal strategy for this task was to give blankets if the probability of the temperature being equal to or below 32 degrees was greater than 16%. And that's based on the penalties and the cost of the blankets. And that brings us to the results. Now we used Bayesian multi-level logistic regression models to calculate the statistics from our findings. Now the first thing to note is that we have two different groups, low is in purple and high is in green. And those were derived from the O-SPAN scores. And down here on the X, we have the probability of a correct response, which is in the alpaca task. How effectively did people issue blankets or withhold blankets based on the correct answer or the optimal strategy that we've previously calculated? And so the first thing I want to point out is that quantile dot plots and densities had the best performance when you collapse across high and low working memory groups. So we're really seeing that these two visualization techniques, the two distributional visualization techniques, are the ones evoking the best performance compared to the summary techniques. So the next thing I want to point out is there is a meaningful difference between high and low working memory groups for the quantile dot plots and for the means. Now I want to call your attention to this right here. For people who had high working memory capacity that viewed quantile dot plots, their performance was the best um, compared to all the other iterations of this experiment. They were even better than people who had high working memory capacity who viewed density plots. This is suggesting that 
when you have high working memory capacity, you can capitalize on the additional frequency information provided in those quantile dot plots. I also want to point out for people with low working memory capacity who viewed the mean plot, they performed the worst out of all the conditions. And what we can do is actually compare each visualization to one another for the different groups. And that's what these plots are showing you here. For all of the quantile dot plots, people with high working memory capacity performed better when they saw the quantile dot plots versus the mean, versus the text, versus the interval, and versus the density. Now, if we look at low working memory capacity, what we find is that both the density plots and the quantile dot plots were better than the mean, text, and interval in some cases. Interesting. But what I really want to point out is that there was no meaningful difference between the quantile dot plot and the density for people with low working memory capacity. So this indicates to me that if an individual has low working memory capacity, they are going to treat a dot plot like a density plot. Okay, the next data that we have is from the NASA TLX. And I'm just going to focus on effort here, because we're mostly interested in effort. The first finding from this analysis is that quantile dot plots require less effort than text and intervals. And that's on average. So if we take the average of quantile dot plots, people are reporting that they require less effort than when viewing intervals or text. So that's really interesting. Quantile dot plots both evoke the best accuracy and people report having less effort when they use those visualizations. The next finding is that the text um, actually requires more effort than the mean plot, which I found interesting. So we're looking at the text there, and notice on average, again, across both groups, that um, people are reporting greater effort with text than the mean. So in terms of closing thoughts, if you have distributional data, consider using a distributional encoding. It seems very simple, but that's not the approach that a lot of people are using. A lot of people seem to think that text works really well, or you can just show the mean because uncertainty is too complicated. That's certainly not what we find. We find consistently that uncertainty helps, and people have a very good intuition for understanding these density distributional visualizations. Even though they seem more complicated, they're pretty intuitive for people to understand. Conveying uncertainty is useful. In particular, this mean plot that didn't show any uncertainty was one of the hardest ones to use. So when you hear a claim that uncertainty is actually harder for people to understand, I don't think that's always the case. It does turn out to be useful in these situations. And the last point is that well-designed uncertainty visualizations outperform text in this case. In closing, the task data and analysis code are available on the Open Science Framework. So you could go there and download our working memory task and evaluate the working memory demand of your own visualizations or tools. With that, I would like to thank my wonderful co-authors, Dr. Spencer Castro, Helia Hosampour, and Dr. Samuel Quinn. Thank you very much.